So, um, thank you for having me today. My name is Isabel Grunschauer. I am a researcher in the field of instructional design and educational technology, and um, mostly in the area of adult education and continuing education. And today I will um, talk about um, professional design and um, in more detail the significance of professional design in work-based learning scenarios. And um, we had already a few things from our colleague um, in the talk before. Um, where I think we can connect. And this is a lot about which methods we could use to improve the process of professionalization in various professions. And for uh, and these are, of course, um, this is also uh, like out outcomes of a Euro European project called um, Professional Testing and Entrepreneurship Education. But as I already said, there are a lot of transversal aspects to it that apply to various professions. But I think that especially the entrepreneurship comp um, component of it is pretty interesting, also in different professions. Um, so let's start. Okay. So what we did is this year, um, my colleague Visa Hartela is also here um, as a guest in the um, online room. He's the co coordinator of the project from the University of Turku, and together we made a semi-systematic liter literature review. Um, and why did we choose it? Um, a lot of fields, different disciplines, different researchers from different disciplines were looking into professional design in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And, um, so there are a lot of different notions around, there are a lot of different research traditions and so on. So um, what we found out for now is it was mostly, um, um, the, the, the most research, research was done in teacher education actually, and most of it in mathematics teacher education. But there are also different professions, but in mostly in the health, in health professions like nursing, for example, where there's also a tradition on noticing and observing. So as you see, there are also a few different terms and uh, like the terminology is pre-scattered. Pre um, and but, but what was all the same in all the different research traditions and all the different research fields was that reflection, observation and noticing was one thing. You know, it wasn't um, um, understood as different processes. And what we now can contribute, I think, also in work-based learning settings, is to have a close look on this process. First, you need to notice uh, when you observe. Okay, we will observe, of course, yeah. Um, but do we notice? And based on what we have noticed, we can interpret it and reflect it. Um, so, I mean, noticing, as I said, lies at the heart of all practice. So all kind of work-based learning scenarios, they are based on the fact that we notice something in the very situation that we are. But we all know also that experience does not equal learning. Um, it needs actually some kind of process. And the reflect, like reflective observation, like Kolb defined it. Um, and this can lead to learning and new knowledge. But what is actually happening in this, this experience and processing part? So this is what we want to look into when we want to look into professional noticing. And so what is it? It includes observation, identification of important aspects, the interpretation, as well as making an informed decision on how to respond in practice. And members of different professions they develop different perceptual frameworks. And this means they um, notice different things in the same situation. Different professions notice different things. So we they view, basically view the world from the lens of the profession. And of course, novices in the profession, they have issues noticing, noticing things. So I guess everybody has once, on, once in a while, I don't know, been a novice in some kind of field and understood, oh my God, I didn't, didn't get it at all. I didn't see it, I didn't got it. But noticing can be learned, but how can it be learned? 
And this is something we want to do in the, like find out in the promise project actually. And so for the literature search, we found out like there's like 175 relevant search results. And I looked on the database site AI. I don't know if somebody knows. Yeah, I see some nodding. Um, it's pretty helpful and it search it searches for mentions. Yeah. Um, so we found um, papers, relevant papers with um, 175. Um, in German, it's called professionelle Wahrnehmung. It's a slightly different term, yeah, because it's based on professional vision, but they are connected, closely connected. Um, so we have 30, uh, 37 um, relevant results. But when we look, we're looking into professional noticing and entrepreneurship, we didn't find anything at all. So it's very new. It's not there yet. And, and professional vision and entrepreneurship has one relevant result. So we'll talk about that a bit later. So it's really new, basically, still. Um, here we see a peak in 2021, but of course, I had this, this statistics done in mid-2023, mid, mid so there might be still a few publications here. So it's not that, you know, low here. Um, and here we see an overview of which professions, you know, were, you know, publishing, in which field it was published. And as you see most, I already said, mostly in mathematics teaching. So what, what did they look into? They actually checked how can teachers understand the learning progress of the students because it's in their mind, obviously. Um, so how do we understand in a teaching situation, the learning progress? Um, but we also have teacher training in general, and we also have emerging here the health profession. And health profession traditionally has a lot of noticing and observation going on. They have observation sheets and forms because not noticing in health means people can die, right? So it's really like a tradition there, but still they, there are more and more papers in professional noticing, also in the health kind of sphere. Because I think it's a missing link, you know, observation, reflection, noticing, there has been, there's a lack of noticing and there is a lack of a pedagogy, how to learn, how to notice. Yeah? So, um, so I think this is a relevant thing also for the health professions. And ah, yeah, so after now, after these numbers now, I have a little experimentation for you. Um, the question is now, um, how many different colors do you see here? And please show with your, your, with your thumbs or with your fingers. Yeah. If you, ah, do you see two? Okay. We see one, four. Wow. Okay. One, one, three. Okay. 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 Um, I will now, um, um, first I can, um, tell you it's just it's two colors yeah. but now the question is where is this one block which number is the which block number is the one block which is a different color it's just one block with different color and show again with your fingers which cup which uh -huh. you, you have block one you think the block number one is a different color right uh, no. uh-huh okay we have five here we have three here, yeah. Another estimations, okay. <laughs> okay. Not. In the chat, um, oh. three. Um, In the chat is yes. three. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> the solution none. is none. <laughs> one. Yeah, I mean also. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the solution is number three is a different color. <laughs> so um, there is the Himba tribe, and the Himba tribe has four um, different words for four as well, for four colors. Yeah, um, and they can immediately tell it's number three immediately. But what they couldn't tell is to see the a, a blue color. They wouldn't check understand that there is the color blue. And um, well. That's very interesting. I didn't know that too. I just, you know, um, I did a bit of learning on TikTok, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> and I stumbled upon this, um, it's, a, it's a scientific kind of TikTok channel. And, they sh and, um, and there I've learned that um, 
very long time in society. We didn't see the, um, the, the, blala, the color blue. We didn't see it. There's like ancient Greek texts and you cannot find blue in there. The, the sea is violet. <laughs> the sea is green, the sky, whatever, you know, it's purple, yeah? but never blue because it was not relevant. And when did blue emerge first? When we were able to create an, uh, that blue color, recreate it. And then suddenly, we blue, uh, there, there are a few other um, um, societies and languages where blue is just not existed as a word. You skipped it. <laughs> <laughs> like blue, it's not, it's not just in the Himba tribe, but there are a lot of languages and they don't have um, blue as a word. Because, yeah, it's not really it's not relevant, you don't have a word. That's why gendering is important, right? <laughs> Side note. <laughs> um, and yeah, interestingly, of course, first there was white and black and um, red, like blood, yeah, very basic. Afterwards, yellow, little green, and the last one was blue. Very interesting. And well, as we see, we need words. If we have words in mind, it's easier for us to notice us. And if it's not relevant to us, it's diff difficult to notice. We don't notice, we don't know what we don't notice unless it has consequences for us. So what are the prerequisites for noticing? First, you need the intention to notice and to learn. So we had that probably now. Yeah, you had the intention to learn and to notice when you were looking at the green blocks. Yeah. Um, you need to be mindful and attentive. So if you're not already very tired now after lunch break, it will be difficult maybe to notice. Yeah. But also you need professional knowledge or in general knowledge. Yeah. And um, propositional procedural. So um, it needs to be relevant to you. Um, and you have to know, I don't know, this is a green color and this it indicates whatever it's toxic or not or edible or I don't know. Yeah. Um, but if you're not trained to see it, yeah, I mean, it's not relevant to you, you wouldn't see it. Yeah. So you need a mental model um, in your mind. It has to be relevant, you need a mental model. So um, this is a chart that we have developed um, in the project and it has to be, it, it was re revised already several times. So what we have here, we have here observing. Um, and I mean, I, as a theme of this presentation, I have this little eye everywhere in each slide, you know, like a layout, yeah. But it's obviously more than just seeing. You smell, you hear, you touch, you know, depending on your profession, all of the senses are very important. Yeah? But okay, okay, observation, that's fine, yeah. We are out there in the world, we're working something, you know, it's like, business as usual, um, we are in a work-based learning setting. Um, but if we are not prepared, um, if, you don't, if you don't have the mental models and the knowledge about certain things, what you know to notice, um, we probably won't identify important aspects to my professional, to the professional situation. I wouldn't able to be reflect, to reflect it properly, interpret it properly, and probably also will choose then, of, uh, because I don't have enough information and data, um, the right direction. But if I'm mindful, attend, intentional, knowledgeable, and so on, I will be able, be able to identify the, identify the important aspects. And um, I will be probably able to interpret it properly, uh, probably appropriately. <laughs> Um, but of course, also here, you know, it could be if you're not, you know, if you cannot, um, um, if you don't have all the, the mental model and the experience or whatever available, you also, there is also a trap here so that you reflect inappropriately. Um, but hopefully you choose the appropriate reaction. So, yeah. And this could be done um, in and on action. This means after a work situation, but also within a work situation. Yeah. And so this is our, at the moment, you know, the model we are working with, but we are continuously um, improving it because we have a lot of workshops and focus groups going on and we always find something new. Okay. Well, now we'll look into noticing in three prof professions. And um, and what we what, what what I've learned, you know, when doing the research on that. Here we have an archaeologist, and um, but if I'm a, me as a lay person, I just see 
dirt and there's a little vase and she's like brushing it okay um it's probably important yeah but i won't be able to tell you know anything based on that picture or based on the dirt that i would see but archaeologists they have a tool to identify the color of dirt or the earth yeah and it's called the mansell color chart and um, the color identification helps them to understand i don't know from which time it is or other um, aspects or an, to, to do a deep analysis of what they have in front of them. And what they do is um, when they have an expert and a novice archaeologist, the expert usually points toward things. What they also do is marking, you know, um, points in, in this, um, um, important points on this kind of um, site where they are. And, <coughs> and they use visual representations, so maps, they draw and to see, you know, and this level of, the, um, of, of, I don't know, digging in, I found whatever, yeah. Um, so that's how the archaeologists are doing it. But I, I mean, I wouldn't, I couldn't tell anything, you know, by just seeing the earth here, the dirt. Um, for teachers, um, I don't know if you are, if any teachers are here, um, who, you know, have gone through teacher college or whatever. Um, but usually, if you're teaching, they have a pretty, you know, strong work-based learning program, usually, at teacher colleges at least. And, um, and the thing is, if you're new, and I went to teacher college, so it's my personal, personal experience. First, when you're in class, you cannot see anything. You don't see the children in front of you. You're so busy with yourself just presenting. Yeah, and um, you couldn't, you know, you, I couldn't get any cue, and it took me some semesters of, you know, little trial episodes to first, you know, I don't know, get, I don't know, to get used to the situation, and to also um, process all the different cues that I would get in the classroom. So, because the situation at work is complex. At university, you get your theoretical framework and so on, five minutes, oh. <laughs> And um, so it's about, you know, um, getting used to and seeing the cues that you have in front of you. And what they use is video analysis, sit-ins and debriefing methods to, you know, connect theory and practice and to help students to notice what, as well, the teacher novices, novice teachers, that to help and help them to notice what the students are doing and how they are progressing in class. Um, and we also had this, this nursing um, example already. Um, what they use is simulations before they get into the, in the, in the working situation in the hospital. They first have sim simulations. Yeah. And so th this is how they are prepared. Yeah? And they work with observation forms um, in the simulation, but also um, in the workplace and with debr debriefing methods. Oops. Um, and so noticing happens in professional practice almost naturally yeah? um, and work-based learning settings support the development of noticing skills so this is for sure yeah but it's very often not very systematic yeah and it's very often only like reduced to reflection um so we have a chance here to connect theory and practice through professional noticing and we especially help students to transfer what they've learned into practice. We prepare, prepare them for practice. We help them that they can continuously learn in practice. But this is not only important for novices, also for continuing education, this is very important. And the, con the concept of noticing helps us also to, you know, have words to describe what happens in case you missed something, you know. It gives you vocabulary. And this is also what we found out in the workshops with our focus groups, like there were entrepreneurs and there were um, education, like entrepreneurship education teachers and lecturers and so on there. And they said, wow, now we have a word for that because they knew it happened, you know, it, it, of course it happens, it's, you know, daily business for them. But now they have words to talk about it. And I looked into a few quality dimensions of work-based learning and work-integrated learning. And I think that it all actually like, Professional noticing can be integrated in that very well to prepare students, um, to support the authenticity, um, also curriculum integration, because of course you need first mental models. It has to, has to be taught first before the, you can send them out into practice, you know, and then you can help them 
notice in practice and connect what they have noticed in practice with the theory again. Yeah? Um, support like in mentors and coaches that, that they need to be, you know, somehow trained on noticing. Um, assessment of reflection of the learning experience. It can be much deeper and richer if you know about the noticing experience. And well, just briefly, um, in entrepreneurship, it's a lot about spotting opportunities and chances because they are, um, in, are surrounded with uncertainty each day. They need a mistake culture. They need, they need to handle the unknown. But I think this is not only relevant for entrepreneurs, but for all professions. They are all in transformation and this digital transformation, societal transformation. So this is actually a quality that we need in general. Yeah? And um, interestingly, in this um, paper that I found, this one paper, <laughs> on entrepreneurship and professional vision, um, was that the line underlined that this team that they they, they actually um, did research on an entrepreneurship team, so they work in teams, yeah. um, usually. Um, and they agree on what they don't know in a team. So to agree on knowing what you don't know is such a vital aspect of further development. The first step to know that you don't know. Um, and well, there is an effectuation principle, so how to handle kind of this everyday uncertainty. Um, I don't have time too much to go into that, but this is actually a future, future skill for many professions, you know, to get, get into this effectuation cycle. And I also checked out innovative emerging trends in work-based learning practice and work-based le and work integrated learning practice. And interestingly, it's micro placements because it's so much easier to have a dual education program um, with big um, players in the industry because they can cover the curriculum more easily. But the SMEs are the backbone of our economy and they also need you know, innovation somehow. So it's how can you, con you know, connect them to the curriculum? It's much more work because it's different stakeholders, more, much more stakeholders to, 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 to um, connect to the curriculum. Also online project and placements, hackathons, competition, events. So this is like out of the box for work integrated learning, like different kinds of settings. Incubators and startups and consulting activities of students for companies. And this is very interesting. So here we solve a bit the issue of how to get SMEs into um, work integrated learning, work based learning programs. And um, we, have, we have also have here some key features. But inter interestingly, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is an important aspect, yeah? And so I think that not only professional noticing itself is of course important for various professions and for continuing education professions and so on, not only um, connecting a mental model to reality, but also to um, further develop your mental model in the future. Um, and what I'm doing in the future now, like from my research is to connect it to instructional design. So how do we have to build learning, meaningful learning experience? How can we build meaningful learning experiences connected to the curricul curriculum supporting professional noticing? And we have a workshop in January, February, whoever everyone who's interested, where I go, you know, and make we'll have a deep dive into instructional design there and work with real um, learning designs for everybody who wants to bring in and build stuff. And um, yeah, and I think I've talked too long, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you. Thank you.